Defense News is proudly sponsored by Navy Federal Credit Union. If you're a member of our nation's armed forces, the Department of Defense, or if your family is, we'd be proud to serve you too. On this edition of Defense News Weekly, we find out what caused Air Force C-130s to be grounded, look at potential new missiles for the U.S. military, and discuss the future of microwave weapons. With in-depth interviews, up-close video, and leading analysis, this is Defense News Weekly. Welcome to this week's edition of Defense News Weekly. I'm Jeff Martin. This week, we're looking at several different topics, all of which are part of America's shift away from counterinsurgency and towards great power conflict. But first, here's some headlines. Nearly 75% of affected C-130 cargo planes are back in the air after cracks in the wing joints caused many of them to be grounded last week. The problem was discovered in an Air National Guard aircraft, and as a result, the service conducted inspections throughout its entire C-130 fleet. So far, only one of the 123 planes that were grounded has detected cracks, and that 123 planes represents about a quarter of the Air Force's C-130 fleet. And questions continue to surround an explosion last week in Nyingoska, Rosha, that supposedly caused a radiation spike on sensors throughout the region. Arms control experts and U.S. officials believe the explosion was a failed test of a nuclear-powered cruise missile, which would explain the radiation spike. According to Russia's nuclear agency, five nuclear engineers were killed in the explosion, but few other details have been released, causing widespread speculation as to what actually happened on that explosion. And can the future control of the THAAD missile defense system, along with its funding, be passed to the Army? Well, not if the new Missile Defense Agency director has anything to say about it. In an exclusive interview with Defense News, Vice Admiral John Hill says he wants to continue to prioritize THAAD and that there are worries that wouldn't happen under the Army. Historically, when MDA programs have transferred to the respective services, their funding can be cannibalized for other needs. This also comes as THAAD production continues to grow and as upgrades are being developed for the system. And South Korea is planning to spend more money to boost its missile defense shield in response to North Korea's growing missile capabilities. According to the country's Ministry of National Defense, under the Mid-Term Defense Budget Plan, the South Korean military would spend about $240 billion, with about $85 billion specifically for arms improvements. The nation is looking to upgrade its current medium and long-range surface-to-air miss and missile defense systems, as well as get more early warning radars and Aegis-equipped destroyers. Other defense improvement plans include deploying unmanned reconnaissance planes and getting five spy satellites by 2023. In the U.S. Army's new multi-domain operations concept, both the realms of space and missile defense will play a key role. Recently, the Space and Missile Defense Symposium, land warfare reporter Jen Judson got a chance to chat with one of the Army officers working to make that happen. Take a look. So we're at the Space and Missile Defense Symposium <laughs> right now. So how, uh, you know, how should we be thinking about incorporating space and missile defense into multi-domain operations? You know, what are you hoping to get across in the panel discussion that you'll be having later? So I mean, to this audience, really, uh, first of all, the, for us to realize that one of our domains is space, mm -hmm. although we've used space assets, you know, for a long, long time. It just becomes more and more prevalent on today's battlefield. One, because the reality is we don't believe we are necessarily will always be dominant mm -hmm. in any domain, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, like, I think we were dominant in space for a long time. We were dominant in the air for a long time. Yeah. Uh, we we're dominant in most domains. Under our concept, we believe, one of the assumptions we make is that we're not gonna be dominant in all those, that we'll have windows at advantage. So. From my standpoint, this audience, when you talk from the space side, I would challenge them to give me that dominance. So I have the privilege of every time I went to combat, I never had to look up and fear, because <laughs> there's always good guys in the air. So I would challenge this community that I would want dominance in space. And on the missile side, the same thing. I mean, obviously, uh, when you look at what Russia and China have done with their missile technology, uh, with their long-range precision fires on their side, mm -hmm. uh, we need to be able to counter uh, everything that they have done. Mm -hmm. uh, and we need to be able to do it in a cost-efficient manner uh, that does not make it um, uh, <laughs> you know, it, you, you can't come up with this unique, great capability, but it just costs so much money that you can't afford it. Yeah. Uh, is the bottom line. So, yeah. I, I mean, so I would challenge industry that was here to do that, you mm -hmm. know, produce something that works really, really well, but let's keep some affordability uh, in mm -hmm. mind. 
With the death of the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, the United States is entering the Wild West of having to develop theater-range missiles for the first time in decades. But is that feasible? And what would those programs look like? To learn more, I went to chat with two experts at the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments in Washington. Here's that interview. And those, have, and those type of missiles have traditionally been some of the most uh, controversial in world history, from IRBMs in Cuba and the Cuban Missile Crisis to the INF, to the creation of the, the INF Treaty when it was out. That's something that the U.S. has dabbled in in the past. We've had them in the past, mm -hmm. but it's really been more of a province of Russia and China. So why, why have them? What's the importance of having a missile with that range? Perfect. Uh, that's a great question. And so it's been controversial, I think, in the past in particular, because uh, because of their relatively sort of short range, that intermediate category, and their fast time of flight in case of some of them, mm -hmm. they could be used for some destabilizing first strikes, especially if they could be armed with nuclear weapons. That mm -hmm. was what was led, in, what led to the original Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty mm -hmm. um, and caused that, the treaty to come into being. Um, and so looking, and so what I was going to say, looking at what Russia and China kind of have mm -hmm. now, that means that those missiles that they've been building, those mm -hmm. they've been, the U.S. necessarily hasn't, which leads to kind of a missile gap. So how, how dangerous is that? No, no, it, it absolutely is a great concern. So uh, starting in around 2008, Russia started fielding the 9M729 uh, ground launch cruise missile. It now has assessed to be over 100 of these missiles, which could be armed with conventional or possibly nuclear warheads to target U.S. forces. China, on the other hand, which was never part of the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, started in the 1990s building this massive arsenal of intermediate range missiles that could target with conventional and nuclear warheads bases ashore and ships at sea. Not only near U.S. allies in Asia, but even far out at sea and all the way out to U.S. territory in places like Guam, the Northern Marianas, or Alaska. Mm -hmm. So these weapons pose sort of considerable challenges to U.S. forces and the U.S. right now, because it doesn't have these weapons, um, suffers considerably in a number of war game simulations that have been run and could lose a real war. And so and how, how big is that gap? I mean, we... Uh, oh, considerable. I mean, China has now thousands of missiles. Uh, the DIA only gives us so much publicly available information, but you're looking at two to 3,000 missiles. Mm -hmm. The Chinese have a ground launch cruise missile of relatively similar range to the ones the Russians used to break the INF, except they have 10 times as many. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's an arsenal that's continually growing by a few hundred a year. The same goes for medium range and their intermediate range uh, missiles have also increased as well. In your report, there was a graphic, that I, there were two graphics that I mm -hmm. saw. The first was just the sheer number of missiles, mm -hmm. that the types of missiles that they have either in development mm -hmm. or active service compared to the United States, mm -hmm. which might have it. And then the second was a map of the Pacific mm -hmm. and showing the ranges of those missiles that China is able to do. Those IRBMs allow them to cover almost the entire Pacific. Yeah. How much of a danger is that for the U.S.? I mean, it's an incredible amount of danger. I, it prevents access on a scale that just U.S. planners previously could not have imagined. Mm -hmm. It's one thing to be denied, you know, access to the littorals, like mm -hmm. a lot of U.S. planners were worried of in the last 10, 20 years, but not access even to, have, to the Central Pacific itself. Not even to have Guam or yeah, Guam and Northern Australia and everything like that kind of in their cover. So what danger, so that kind of leads me to my next question, which is if the U.S. didn't work on these, how, what, what kind of a decision would that be? Not a very good one or? Yes, yeah, so, so as I mentioned that the U.S. routinely suffers sort of significant uh, levels of casualties and loses war game simulations run and, and we think could actually lose a war, uh, not only because we don't have our own missiles to be able to engage enemy forces, but also because we don't have enough missile defenses really to be able to engage Chinese in particular missiles as they come in in large salvos. Um, I think if the U.S. were to introduce these uh, types of missiles though, it could provide some sort of important operational advantages to commanders. It would provide a, a responsive strike capability that could attack enemy forces as soon as they're detected, either on their own, mm -hmm. but perhaps the more important uh, use of the, these systems would be in support of other uh, aspects of the yes. joint force in order to create operational access. Mm -hmm. So for example, you could imagine some very fast ground launch, crew, uh, ground launch hypersonic or boost glide or, hyper, or hypersonic ballistic missiles mm -hmm. being fired by Army or Marine Corps forces mm -hmm. against enemy air defenses, key points in that air defense. And then we could have sea or air launch cruise missiles attack other parts of that air defenses. And then air forces could use even lower cost weapons. So ground launch cruise missiles can provide this complementarity that can allow other parts of the force to enter into the space. As another example, sort of a more cross domain one, you could envision using very long range ground launch um, intermediate range missiles to engage key anti-satellite sensors inside the territory of an adversary in order to blind their anti-satellite weapons mm -hmm. and in order and in turn allow US satellites to be able to operate over that area and provide communications or sensing. 
So uh, these ground launch missiles are important sort of on their own in terms of the strike effects they can achieve, but I think they're probably even more important in terms of how they can cooperate with other aspects of the force. So this is just uh, kind of filling in the kind of filling in the tool to, the toolbox, so to speak, for U.S. commanders in any sort of in any sort of conflict. Now, we, I think we can all agree that this is something the United States needs. So what can they so what can they field? What are the options? Sure, certainly. Uh, so you know there are a number of trade-offs the United States has to consider in terms of what it can field and in what timelines it wants to be fielding mm -hmm. systems. Uh, the fact of the matter is, the, f the systems that we will most quickly get out there are systems we currently have that are just simply not ground launched. One of the most commonly uh, cited examples and probably the quickest to be fielded is a ground launch version of the Tomahawk cruise mm -hmm. missile. Um, Tomahawk itself is, uh, was a variant of the ground launch cruise missile at the, uh, at the end of the 1980s. Mm -hmm. uh, there are there's some credible open source reporting that that could be done in 2021. We could IOC a ground launch cruise missile capability on that timeline. Uh, the precision strike missile could very well also be extended past INF ranges, and uh, the Army is struggling, but they seem confident to be able to IOC that in 2023. Okay. So these things are coming. Uh, in terms of if we want a Pershing three ballistic missile mm -hmm. uh, instead of the two, that, that's probably an outside of five year situation, okay. uh, even with consistent funding and attention. And it's not clear we're going to get that. Mm -hmm. The House has cut almost all funding for INF systems uh, in its versions of the NDAA and appropriations bill, with the exception of the long, uh, strategic long range cannon, the precision strike missile. Wow. So the mobile medium range missile and the long range hypersonic weapon were left unfunded. Uh, and those are what we believe to medium range and intermediate range. So 1,000 to 5,500 in that broader range. Those are, uh, and those are range capabilities we desperately need in the Western Pacific. Uh, Pacific. So, so uh, looking at that, so we have, we've, we've had NDAAs passed in a, but, in a mm -hmm. but, but we haven't necessarily had appropriations packages yet yes. for the military. Do you see that being some, do you see those programs with INF expiring very recently that could be kind of, that could get some congressional focus in the appropes bills or? I, I, I they have encountered a great deal of congressional hostility, particularly in the House, because a lot of our political leaders associate the INF uh, with being a nuclear treaty, not a missile treaty. And the fact of the matter is, technology has evolved to where it is a missile treaty now, not a nuclear treaty. None of these INF systems we're proposing are even nuclear mm -hmm. uh, armed. Yeah, we aren't talking nuclear weapons, yeah. we're talking conventional, exactly. and that's... And um, but that's not something necessarily that, that's getting through to a lot of them. Mm -hmm. uh, so what they're seeing is you're returning, yeah, nuclear armed missiles to a particular contested region of the world, you're... And the occupant of the White House doesn't necessarily help with any no, of that. No, it, it doesn't, you know. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I think the good news is that there's a recognition that this, this class of system is necessary, um, but I think there is space mm -hmm. for, for DOD in particular to engage some of the leadership in, yes. in the House and other parts of Capitol Hill mm -hmm. to explain the rationale why these ground launch systems are necessary mm -hmm. and then also um, explain why maybe some of their concerns regarding nuclear escalation mm -hmm. or, or basing uh, could likely be managed in a number of different ways uh, given that we're focused on conventionally armed intermediate range missiles. Mm -hmm. So now that the INF treaty is gone it provides the U.S. an opportunity to actually start sort of the level of the playing field compared to what China and Russia have been doing. So one thing the United States says is that they're going to test launch an IRBM type missile later this year. This year, yeah. Okay, the United States, has, as far as we know, there hasn't been an active development program or anything mm. like that. So what do you guys think is going to happen with that? So the, the U.S. has <laughs> yeah. been working uh, more or less the past decade on the advanced hypersonic weapon, which mm -hmm. was led by the Army and then also is being explored for use uh, for the naval applications as well. So I think it w it's likely that the U.S. will be able to field some sort of initial capability with an advanced hypersonic payload or you know, initial ballistic booster and perhaps in a hypersonic payload mm -hmm. or a complete ballistic missile profile uh, in the near term. Uh, as Adam mentioned, though, uh, the question is how quickly can we ramp up the production of that, right? Because I think it's one thing to have one or a few tests or even sort of a, a battalion of these, but in order to have significant numbers where we're talking about hundreds on the scale of yeah. what the Russians have or what the Chinese will have, it'll probably require some changes to the industrial base to be able to, to match those production levels. And that industrial base was actually going to be something that I was thinking of as we were talking about this. The, this is a massive open gap. This is what a classic business development person sees as a, as a, as a hole to be exploited. Mm -hmm. this, is some, this is a type of, this is a class of weapon that the U.S. hasn't had for years, and they're having to go in. How do you see the defense industrial base being able to handle the production for something like that? Is it because it's not really there right now for the U.S.? What do you, what do you guys think? Yes, so uh, I think there's been a considerable progress over the past five years in particular regarding some of the hypersonic boost glide systems that mm -hmm. is transferable to these new intermediate range weapons because some of these could be hypersonic boost glide weapons. 
there's also a pretty mature industrial base in terms of weapons like the Tomahawk that Adam yeah. mentioned. Mm -hmm. And then even in terms of perhaps a Pershing III that could be based off of a Pershing II design, there's a lot of know-how there. But in terms of, I think, engineering skills, that needs to be ramped up. Um, and in terms of manufacturing of these at low costs. And so you could see OSD leaders and service leaders talking to industry and emphasizing how they want systems that could be developed, tested, and fielded in low quantities, but they also want systems that have manufacturability built into their design so that they could be built in numbers at relatively lower costs. Yeah, so I'll just echo what Tim said there. We're really looking at this as a family of systems, a high-low mix of capabilities. So you'll want you know, those limited capabilities of you know, hypersonic strike weapons, prompt, uh, break down the door type systems, mm -hmm. and then follow on with systems you know, like a ground launch cruise missile, which you can produce in great quantities and deliver in mass, mm -hmm. deliver the real firepower that achieves decisive effect. To keep up to date with all of our coverage, be sure to visit our Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn pages. Also, be sure to add us on Apple's News app and other platforms for the latest updates. And when we come back, we'll look at the development of laser and microwave weapons for the Army. The development of both directed energy and microwave weapons is a top priority for the U.S. Army and is the realm of the Rapid Capabilities and Critical Technologies Office, led by Lieutenant General Neil Thurgood, who recently spoke to Jen Judson on the topic. Uh, I also want to shift gears over to the directed energy side, mm -hmm. um, as well as some of the things you're doing with the um, IFPIC program, the Indirect Fire Protection Capability Program. Um, and I thought it was interesting your efforts to add high power microwave um, capability that, you know, obviously you want, as you said this morning, a lot of tools in your toolbox, you know, we're looking at ram threats and UAS and cruise missiles, so lasers, missiles, now high power microwaves. Can you talk a little bit about the thinking behind wanting to add that, what, why is that important, um, and how you're going about, um, do, you know, acquiring something like that from industry? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. In the, in the directed energy realm, we were at a different start point than we were in the hypersonic realm. So in the directed energy realm, there is an industrial base that exists, right? There are companies that can make these things. And so teaming with the Space Missile Defense Command, the Lieutenant General Jim Dick, Dickinson, a good, a good battle buddy, um, they already had some contracting mechanisms in place for those efforts. So on the MSHORAD mission, which is the 50 kilowatt on a striker, we just modified that strategy a little bit. So we took the effort, the great work that had been done by that community, we modified it for a little bit different uh, outcome. Um, so that, that work really set the conditions for us. On the IFPIC mission, um, again, there was an existing contract uh, to do that. We took that fundamental strategy and modified a little bit to make it a little more powerful laser because uh, technology has advanced. And so uh, that, that's really important for us. The reason we added high power microwaves to it is, is to your point, which is there, there's a series of, of a list of threats out there that we have to be prepared to fight. And, and there's not one weapon system that does them all equally as good, right? So by adding, adding high power microwaves, we can add to the toolkit of the ground commander, in this case, uh, the ability to kill those lists in parallel and sequence or give him more tools so he can be successful on the battle space. Okay, can you talk about the process that you're um, going through and where you are with um, potentially um, maybe issuing an OTA for a high-powered microwave? Um, you know, what are you looking at in terms of timeline? How does that sort of compare to the rest of your efforts? There? Yeah, no, that, that's a, a great question. So in the hypersonics domain, it is a one battery in FY23, right? So that's our mission set. With the MSHORAD, it's one platoon in 22. And then in the IFPIC mission, it's one platoon in 24. The high power microwave is linked to the IFPIC mission set currently. Um, so that's also in 24. Um, now in the case of a high power microwave, we're actually gonna team with another service okay. for that outcome, right? I, they're, they're already, they already have some great work. I don't need to repeat that great work. We can team with them and, and get the advantage of that work uh, together and use that system because uh, it really meets all the requirements that we have. Okay, so uh, it sounds like you potentially would be helping to, to fund, I, didn't use, I believe it was the Air Force that you're, you're teaming with, um, so you will be helping to fund prototyping that they, are, that they are engaged in. Yeah, so they're doing the work, um, they're doing the work of the design piece, uh, and we think in about 21 or 22 they'll be ready to make prototypes 
And so we'll join them at that point with their prototyping effort. Okay. And then in terms of what you have to do specifically um, in 22 to bring it online to the IFPIC mission, is there anything that um, you're going to have to do, any milestones that you'll have to you know, reach to, at that point to you know, integrate it into IFPIC at that point? Um, is that a contract, an integration contract, or what does that look like? Yeah, so, so I don't know all the details of how that's actually going to look, look in, the, in the contract mechanism. We may be able to use the existing Air Force contract to do that work um, because it's really a similar set of missions, right? Or, or if, it's, if that doesn't work out, then we'll probably put an OTA out because we're going to build a prototype system, okay. right? So it definitely has to work inside the Army Command and Control System. Uh, so that will be a little bit different than the Air Force system. So there will be some work that has to be done. Mm -hmm. So we'll actually start standing up in FY21 uh, that mechanism, those decisions will get made okay. as we go forward, put a, a small team together to do the work. Okay. And then we'll make the decision to, to buy the prototypes in 22, okay. do the integration work and then field them in 24 at the same time we field the IFPIC okay. high energy laser piece. So those are paired okay. together, okay. currently paired together. When we come back, we'll see the story of one veteran who's made a mark in the business world. On this week's Money Minute, Navy Federal Credit Union personal finance expert Brian Parker offers his latest tips. All parents know that sending their student off to college costs a pretty penny. Military members and their families receive education funding through the GI Bill. If it doesn't cover everything, federal or private student loans can help fill the gap. But college costs involve much more than tuition, like housing, meal plans, and textbooks. In addition to work-study programs and taking advantage of free resources at your fingertips, how do you keep all the costs of these extra items down? Here are some ideas. Comparison shop at your campus bookstore and online for textbooks. You can also rent textbooks from some online stores or get used books. Meal plans are another place where students can cut back by planning out their meals wisely. Living off campus can be inexpensive, but it might be even better to live on campus because it's a set price. When you move off campus, Utilities, security deposits, and transportation can drive up your expenses. Military families can also shop at the exchange to get all of their dorm room essentials like bedding, towels, school supplies, laptops, and more, all tax-free. So once you've written that tuition check, keep these options in mind for a more affordable college experience. Thanks, Brian. We'll see you next time. To get more Defense News coverage, be sure to visit our website at defensenews.com and subscribe to our early bird brief, delivered to your inbox every weekday morning to get you ready to start the day. And when we come back, we'll see the story of one veteran who's made quite the mark in the business world. At this year's Service Member of the Year Awards, Patrick McKenna was recognized for the impact he's made after leaving the service. This is his story. One of the most valuable things that I learned in my service in the military when people work together, they learn to respect each other. My name is Patrick McKenna. I was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the Army Signal Corps in 1992. My first assignment was Korea, where I worked in military intelligence. Then off to Panama, where I had a couple jobs, where I worked as an XO for a Signal Corps company. I always had this deep sense of patriotic duty, and that sense of duty kind of followed me all through high school. The Army was the one that gave me the most options. They were willing to just take a bet on me as a high school senior and said, major in anything you want. After four years, we're gonna pull you in and we're gonna train you on something, and we have the confidence that you're gonna be able to make a great contribution. The service in the military actually very well prepares you for a career in business. Probably the piece that people least understand is how being successful in the military is a team effort, and how you collaborate in teams is critical in business. I have had a lot of success hiring veterans and spouses of active duty military. I have over 1,500 working today, and over the last 10 years, it's over 10,000 veterans and military spouses who have worked in my companies. So my experience with hiring veterans has been incredibly positive. Military veterans coming out have the exact skills that are critical to the future of work. Many of the things that I learned in my military service define who I am today. Probably the most important is to see the mission as bigger than yourself and incorporate your fellow citizens. 
when you meet other veterans in the business world and you immediately get connected. It is such a powerful network, whether you were in a different branch or you're in a different operational background, we always find some common ground. My military service makes me feel very proud. Very proud as a veteran, very proud as an American, and very proud to represent so many other veterans who I know who are making an impact in their communities. While my role as an active duty soldier may have ended, my service hasn't stopped. That's all we have time for this week, but if you want to see and read more, be sure to head over to defensenews.com. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. Defense News is proudly sponsored by Navy Federal Credit Union. If you're a member of our nation's armed forces, the Department of Defense, or if your family is, we'd be proud to serve you too.